in private that we are very happy about. I will come with him. I'm very this book with a little song. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Are you there? Are you there? What do you do? Do some good claps. Thank you. So kindly show us the book. Go on, sir. We are now going to the regional. Now that we know that there is somebody in the north, there's somebody in the west, and we have another person in the east. Now region will be all day now. Thank you. And I want to present the book with my other friends. Well, if each one of us has to take responsibility and do the right thing, then Nigeria will be better for each and ever we see. I will not accept. The reason why I was minority leader and making trouble is... International, before later he deployed to the political desk, where he will ultimately make his professional mark and earn national recognition. Apparently, because of his experience in student journalism, it did not take long before he also began to aspire for leadership positions in journalism. First, with the National Association of Foreign Affairs Correspondents in 1987, where he contested and won the position of publicity secretary. But it was while covering the political beat for Daily Times that his star shone show brighter with his election as NAPOC chairman. Although Ike Mono of the news agency of Nigeria was founding NAPOC chairman, he also succeeded his Daily Times colleague, Bega Adeshina. The election that brought Mwosu to office was rather dramatic because he defeated his opponent, Malam Isa Oseni of Nan, by just one vote. The author recalls what transpired at the election, especially how he believed the reporter from the Southwest ganged up against him. I remember that episode too, but in a different way. I'm sure many will dispute the ethnic slant the author was to what happened. But nobody will doubt that he was, was a very effective NAPO chairman. With the death in 1998 of both Abiola and Abacha, and the ascension to power of General Absalami Abaka, a certain General Richard Abbasida was released from prison, following which a transition to civil rule program was unfolded. The former military leader was drafted into the presidential race on the platform of the PDP, led by the late Second Republic Vice President Alex Kwebe, and Mr. Oye Magachuku was appointed to manage the media for Ambassador. He tapped Ngosu to join him in the assignment. The rest, as they say, is now history. From newsroom, he also moved into the arena of practical politics with all his intrigues and power play. When Ngochuku was eventually nominated for the position of the pioneer chairman of the then newly formed NDDC under President Ambassador, who also described the behind the scenes drama of Gochuku's confirmation by the Senate. In 2007, the author contested for the House of Representatives in his own Kwano Maya federal constituency on PDP platform. By his account, he was muzzled out before joining the Action Congress. <laughs> Readers will enjoy the narratives of the experience. However, the author must be reminded that while Atiku Abaka may have been the flag bearer of the party at the time, he was not the leader. AC, as I can recollect, was a special purpose vehicle put together by Asuaju Bolame Tinubu to replace the Alliance for Democracy, which brought him to power. In the book, the author also details his travels and community efforts, as well as other roles he has played in the past few years. The book closes in chapter 25 with Looking Ahead, a commentary by the author on the state of our union in Nigeria. The challenges we currently face are what to consider as the way out. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, overall, 
Media policy and power in Nigeria, the personal perspective by Emeka Mosu, one of the finest journalists of his generation, is written in this imitable style. Although it contains some typos and could have been better edited, the 256-page book is one I will strongly recommend for those who seek to know more about Emeka Mosu's background, as well as for members of the Twitter generation who refuse to accept that without the benefit of social media, our generation fought and pra practically wrestled the military to the ground for Nigeria to enjoy the current democracy, however imperfect it may be. With the maturity that comes with age, experience, and exposure, the author's patriotism signs through the collection. He agonizes over the challenges we face, while at the same time preferring a solution to some of them. At the end, what the author says most clearly is that we can... I have to call you people. <laughs> I'll try to take your own uh, perspective, sir. Well, it's a good one. I'm more excited uh, that uh, this has uh, put, been put together by uh, journalists, you know, uh, renowned journalists for that matter. Uh, it's not always that uh, it should just be about politicians, you know, putting together events for us to come and applaud them. Uh, today, as the NUJ president, I am, I am so proud to be associated with the author, who incidentally is my elder brother. Uh, uh, having come from the same community with him. So you can see how joyous I am uh, coming to be part of this event and for his ability to gather the cream de la cream of the society to come and uh, uh, witness uh, this uh, book launch, uh, which uh, has also come at a very critical time in the nation's history, a time where, when we are going through a transition period. Uh, you can see that uh, the level of uh, political activities, uh, 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 they are on a feverish pitch. Uh, you can see party primaries and all that. So we've come to look at a book which uh, appreciably captures the role of the media, uh, the role of politics, and the rest of them in building uh, a, a thriving uh, democratic system. Basically, that's why we're here. And uh, it's come at a very good time. And I believe that uh, by the time we are done with this event, we'll be able to lay it very clear uh, before the political actors that have taken over the center stage at this time that uh, uh, politics goes beyond uh, 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 rhetorics. It goes beyond uh, just uh, winning uh, an election. Politics uh, should equally have to do with uh, delivering on your campaign promises. Politics would have to be about delivering uh, good governance. Politics must have to be about impacting on the uh, living standard of the people. Politics should be about changing the narrative. Politics should be about uh, people, should be people-centered. You know, p politics should not about, uh, be about self-serving. It should be about the people. Understanding that uh, democracy itself is rooted in the people. You know, so I believe that uh, this gathering is one that is very auspicious, very apt, timely, and uh, it sure fits the bill. Well, uh, I would always say that uh, our operating environment has not been the best you know, for the media because we are faced with a plethora of uh, uh, challenges staring all of us in the face and they uh, substantially uh, affect uh, productivity. You know? We have our peculiar challenges when you stand with other uh, contemporaries and other clients, you will see that uh, what is available to them is not available to you. You know, and that's why we will continue to appeal to stakeholders, not just media stakeholders, government, because we are all uh, 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 we are partners. 
in progress. So we appeal to them that uh, they must have to build a sinner climb for us, a conducive working environment for the media. A situation where you have issues about uh, clamp down on the media, intimidation, harassment, poor remunerations, and arbitrary arrest and what have you. Uh, you know, it's not the best. Uh, you know, when you keep having that, there is that psychological trauma that it rots on the people on the practitioners, on the professionals, you know, that becomes a huge, uh, you know, challenge. But I believe that uh, going forward, we must be filled with optimism. Let's not be pessimistic about it. Uh, we believe that tomorrow will be a lot better. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. American was uh, has been in the, uh, in, in the midst of everything that has happened in Nigeria as a political correspondent. And so what he's sharing with us today through his book is the role that the media has played in politics in Nigeria. And it's a very interesting book, very readable, and uh, full of insights about how we got to where we are today. And uh, we commend people to read this book because sometimes we in Nigeria tend not to look at our history. We tend to turn a blind eye to what is happening, not knowing that part of what we see today had also happened in the past. And so we do not learn lessons, and so we tend to repeat what happens before. So this is part of our, I would say, learning process as a nation, and uh, we need to use this type of books to determine for ourselves how we are going to go forward as a country. We either have to make it, or this country will just head into the abyss. So it's a book that I commend to everybody, and I'm very glad to be here. All right, so now they have enumerated many challenges, um, ranging from poverty, you know, uh, lack of social, like, poverty, rather. Um, also, accountability, like, I will just make only one point here. There is only one thing that is uh, the problem with Nigeria. It's accountability. People do wrong things. People do heinous things. People go ahead and uh, despoil the country and they don't pay a price for it. And it is just because people are not punished for wrong behavior that we have worse and worse things happening. And once we can get that right and people are punished for doing the wrong thing, then the, party, uh, the country will be set on the right path. Thank you very much. Is we were producing more, so that's why this book is very important. Because you know, with hard work, with honesty, because when you also imbibe honesty, there will be no need for corruption. There will be no need for corruption. People don't know this, you know, because anything you want to do, you want to be sure that you are honest about it, and then you'll be looking at the common good. How does this affect your neighbor? Knowing that you know, if your neighbor is in pain, that pain will also come to you. Anyway, I recommend this book uh, to be read by all. And uh, I have already told the author, I cannot do anything publicly, but I will see him privately. So I congratulate you again. And I thank all of you who have honored him and us by coming to witness this very important ceremony. This book, I've not read it, but I feel very happy that a Mecca Mosu PhD uh, found time to write uh, media, politics, and power in Nigeria. I join the chairman, the distinguished chairman, in congratulating you. 
Uh, we expect that you write more books uh, for us uh, in Nigeria. So many people should be writing books and not doing so. But uh, book writing is very, very important uh, for making sure that the history of the nation is recorded and also in building a strong uh, institutions as uh, the book reviewer, uh, no, sorry, the keynote uh, address uh, stressed uh, because we need uh, strong institutions and we also need uh, strong leaders. Uh, both of them are important in building a nation, particularly a nation like ours uh, that um, yeah, is multi-religious, uh, multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic, and uh, but uh, what we must all recognize is that the greatest strength that Nigeria has is in her diversity. So once we're able to uh, manage our diversity very well, uh, we will get Nigeria to the level that God wants us to be. Because if you look at our country, uh, Nigeria has passed through a number of uh, you know, problems, challenges that many other countries tried to pass through, but they couldn't. Uh, but uh, there must be a reason why God allowed us to always uh, pass through these challenges and come out even uh, stronger. So but we need to make sure that in addition to having strong men, we also, strong men and women, we also have uh, strong institutions. Now, looking at this book, it's very clear that we must commend our journalists, uh, the media, for the role that the media has played in nation building. Without the media, I believe that Nigeria would not have been independent Politically, independent, must never have achieved political independence in 1960. I believe that very strongly, and I want to be challenged by historians. And for that, I especially remember uh, one of our greatest sons, uh, not just in Nigeria but in Africa, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, who uh, went to the United States of America got degrees in so many disciplines, but returned first to Ghana, where he practiced journalism. From Ghana, he now came to Nigeria, and with, uh, he established a chain of uh, newspapers, both in the north and in the south, and used those newspapers to mobilize Nigerians and prepare Nigerians for the struggle for independence and uh, he worked with many others, and finally uh, they delivered political ind independence to us uh, on October 1, 1960. Also, when we had military rule in the country stretching uh, from one year to the other, again, it was the media, the journalists who mobilized Nigerians again to say no, we need to return to democracy, civilian rule. So we owe you a lot. And uh, even on that civilian rule, your role is so critical, very important, you know, to make sure, you know, that yes, that we deliver good governance, good governance to our people for the common good to ensure that Nigeria gets the best that she should at all times. Uh, I would like to draw from what the chairman said, uh, who possibly read this book, uh, that this book, in addition to uh, addressing issues with respect to media, uh, politics, and power in Nigeria, also talked about the uh, life history of this great son of Nigeria. Emeka Mosu, PhD. Though I would have preferred to call him Dr. Emeka Mosu, <laughs> if he doesn't mind, because he deserves both of them. And I believe very strongly that 
you know, since he lived in the village, that uh, this book is very helpful in making the nation recognize that there is the need for us to go back and rediscover those values that made us very strong in the past. Very, very strong in the past. Let us never forget that at the dawn of independence in the 50s, 60s, there were three countries that the world said, yes, these emerging countries will rule the world, will lead the world sometime. Brazil, Nigeria, and India. I'm sure many of us remember this. And I believe that this will be achieved. Uh, though, uh, you know, Brazil and India, they are, you know, they moved further away from us because they have embraced technology, science, and innovation, and entrepreneurship, you know, far more than we have done. But the work that President Muhammad Buhari is doing, uh, once we keep building on that, we will catch up with them and overtake them. But we need those values that we find in our rural areas. What are these values? What? <laughs> okay, yeah, don't worry, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Just, just, just be patient. Just be patient. <laughs> yes, so those values, particularly, 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 you know, hard work. Hard work. You know, in our rural areas, you find our mothers, our fathers, our parents, even grandparents. They leave very early in the morning, they go to the farm, and they return only in the evening. This is something they do virtually every day. We need to know that you can't get anything without working for it. And that is how we can now move our nation from being a consumer nation to be a producer nation so that we can produce many of the things that we now consume in our country. And we should be able to now export the surplus you know, to other countries. When you do this, you will find that you will be creating so much wealth in the nation. You will also be strengthening you know, our currency. I do tell people that 1981, December 1981, I returned from the United States of America, where I went just for my last degree. Exos, there's no argument that the media, politics, and power are interconnected. But to a large extent, each one has its own sphere of influence. And each one operates in a manner that, though related, but could operate independent of the other. When politicians, for example, sit down to conduct the whole trading that ends up either in consensus or, or in stepping down or in determining to support one person, at that point in time, even Senior journalists like Chegun Ajeni may not know what is going on at that point in time. Osita Okechuku, who is a mixture of both media and politics, will tell you sometimes these inner discussions that are held that have political implications for the larger political system, they are hidden from us. The media does not know. The media can speculate from morning till night, but the final, the, the final issues that determine did sometimes result in a subject which you would not even know. So the, even though they are related, but they operate different. But it is important, and very, very important, that we understand that an open and free society cannot play its politics, deploy its power, without the media holding people in power accountable to the people. 
So to that extent, the media's role in politics goes beyond just determining what the political discourse is, but to go deeper as to hold those in power accountable for their actions, for their decisions, because their decisions, like the chairman says, when you narrow the political space, one of the things you get, very positive benefit, is that even if you recycle people, you're also making use of the institutional memories of these people. And if these institutional memories result in positive development, we all gain from it. But if the people have a limited understanding of the governance process and you recycle them, then you are recycling that same limited understanding. And probably some of us believe that that is why the Nigerian system had refused to grow because it is within the realm of the limited understanding of some of our leaders that we've been going around and around and around and around in this situation. And because we have failed to develop very strong institutions, rather we have very strong individuals pretending over very weak institutions, the capacity of institutions to serve the public is limited by the lack of capacity of the leadership of those institutions. So the person who is the head of the institution has his own limitations and he thinks every other person around him cannot go above his unlimited understanding and he puts a ceiling and that ceiling becomes the ceiling for society and that ceiling limits society from growing. I understand that and this is true, that there was a person who served as a minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for more than two years. And it was on the day he was removed as a minister that he called the meeting of the directors and was apologizing to them that he was meeting them for the very first time. <laughs> I'm not making it up. It's within the public space. <laughs> so what that means is that because we had a limited capacity to govern the system, he never held a management meeting with his directors, and nobody would rise up to say, look, Mr. This is an institutional requirement for you to hold a meeting of management. So the whole system was limited by his own narrow understanding of what his role was, and we suffered for it as a nation. And I bet you until the day he apologized to the directors for not knowing them, no media had pointed out the fact that the man had not held one management meeting throughout his tenure as a minister. We also had a minister who wanted he was removed. We were told that he had a house here in Abuja, but he was living in Hilton throughout his day at the expense of state. And yet, we are not holding these people of power accountable. I am not the book, book reviewer. I have not read the book, I must confess. But I'm sure if we talking politics, power, and the media, we must look for a fulcrum to which to place our de this determination of whether media is holding people in power accountable or they are not holding them. Now, another, I have had several discussions with Dr. John Kyle fired me, and I'm sure if he were here, there are issues he could have raised that are germane to our development. The chairman raised one of such issues. Is it possible for us as a country to forge some level of elite consensus around 
the number of poor values. Because as it is now, because we, the elites said here, have not formed the common consensus around even good and bad. The concept of good and bad, what is good and what is bad, we have not forged common consensus. We have allowed the general public to also go in the same direction. So everything we look at, we look at is from the perspective of where is that person coming from or where is that event taking place. If it happens and you're a person you are close to is responsible, whether it is bad or good, or to you it is good. If it is a person you don't like, whether it is good or bad, to you it is bad. And to that extent, we have failed as a nation to forge common values around which we would all agree that these values are shared values and they are the values that would engineer growth, development, progress, prosperity, and make us a better nation. What are those values? Values such as integrity. What do we define as integrity? Is it the grandstanding in the media that somebody comes out and makes very fine speeches and tells you old stories about himself that he has denied, refused this, or done this, or not done that? That is integrity. Or oh, is it in the fine character that he displays in his everyday connection with other people around him? Do we have a shared view of what constitutes equity? Beyond just lamentations about further character or whatever we're talking about, do we have real concerns as a people about what constitutes equity? Must it be equitable if I get it and she's denied? Does it constitute equity? Do we have a shared understanding of the word equity? Do we have a shared understanding of what is fair, fairness? Do we have a shared understanding of what is inclusion? Do we have a shared understanding of what is justice? Are we sharing those core values? I come from Adama State. We had six gubernatorial candidates in Memphis. In, the, in God's wisdom, he picked a woman as our candidate, defeated five men. All five men, except, I mean, about three, two of the five men wrote petitions she cannot be, she will repeat this thing, disqualify her, she's a woman, Islam does not allow women to live, another, another, another. Are we prepared to be fair, just? equitable and inclusive. If we still look at women from that perspective, is that woman going to go to the state with the Quran and the Hadith? Is it not the constitution? Is the constitution the same we are both equal? Is it possible for any one of us seated here, for example, to raise one hand and clap? You've been clapping for me, but can you clap with one hand? Is it possible? You need two hands to clap. We need men, women, everybody. Inclusion is key. It's part of equity. It's part of fairness. It's part of justice. But how can you say you want equity, you want fairness, you want justice? We've been eulogizing our sister there because she came from America. She, we presume she has dollars, so she's a very good woman. <laughs> if we didn't presume that she had dollars, she would have been sitting somewhere there. <laughs> what is that? Is that the values we promote? Now, I want to conclude, but I'm going to conclude on a note of caution to all of us. I'm sure if Kai if I were here, he would speak to the issue I'm going to speak to today. 
we must accept that the poverty level in our country is definitely, definitely high, extremely high and unacceptable. We must also admit that the social inequality we have created in this country is so wide. And we must also admit that the elite insensitivity to the plight of ordinary people in this country is also getting out of hand. If we do not address those three issues, it is not about restructuring. We have learned that issues around the structures of states do not actually create much impact on the life of ordinary people. We started this country with three leaders. There were issues of inequalities. We went to four. Issues of inequalities, we went to 12. Issues of inequalities, we went to 19. Issues of inequality, we went to 21. Issues of inequality, we went to 30. Issues of inequality, we went to 36. There are still issues of inequality. Meaning, what we're doing is that we're just multiplying the problems we have in this country into smaller, smaller, smaller units and not addressing the problem. Those who are in the Senate, uh, the former Senate Majority Leader, when they were, they were talking about reviewing the Constitution, I understand there were nearly a hundred presentations for creation of more states. We're still, we're still begging the issue. It's not a question of where does the leader come from, or what structures we are running, or who is who. The question is, why are we tolerating poverty? Why are we tolerating social inequality? And why are we tolerating insensitivity of those of us that are elites who can go and do our birthdays in Dubai when in our villages people sleep hungry every day? Why do we tolerate a situation where despondency, if you go to the village, you would see poverty and despondency walking naked in the streets? You don't have to be told that there's poverty. But we are here in the cities, burying our heads in this coziness of the city, deluding ourselves that all is well in this country. Nothing is well. You cannot end kidnapping, you cannot end the, the, the social strife, you cannot end farmer underclass, you cannot end all of this unless you end the issues of poverty, you end the issues of social inequality, and unless we become more empathetic as members of the elite class, and unless we become more sympathetic, and unless we become more sensitive to the plight of ordinary parents out there. That is our situation. Finally, Mr. Chairman, sir, I hope the book reviewer will do justice to the book, and I hope that the very senior journalists that are seated here and those of us that are still in the profession will try to find a middle ground where we can moderate the role of the media in the road to power. The campaigns we're going to face coming for the next election, we must insist that they must be issue-based we must try as much as possible to reduce the incidences of divisions within our fault lines as issues for conversing for elections. It has nothing to do with where you come from or who you are or what you're doing, but it has to do with the interests of our country as Nigeria. If we are still committed to the unity of this country, then the unity of this country should be our basis. But like Tino actually said, if you want us to be united, tell me what we are going to do with that unity. Are people united to kill somebody who is still united? Or what did they use their unity for? Thank you very much. For <laughs> it's information is power. And I've always believed that. Then one day, my son, just do my attention. You know, if, if if you are a real, if you really want to be useful as a human being, listen to children, particularly your own children. 
There is a perspective with which they look at you that others outside will not see. There are things people who know me outside may be a little bit fearful of telling me. But my kids, because I have, of course, uh, my family is democratic. Everybody would tell you so long as they keep within the bounds of responsibility, responsible behavior, I allow them. My son just called me and then played a clip from one Game of Thrones or something like that. It's a pleasure and privilege to welcome all our esteemed guests and friends who have come from far and near to be with us on this auspicious occasion. I give all glory to God Almighty who has made this day a reality. And the area that has been in the womb of time, a dream come true. It can only be Him that has made this day possible. I cannot thank Him enough for His strength, energy, and inspiration to embark on this project. It is perhaps important to note that this is not the first time that I am putting my thoughts together in a book. But one thing that is unique about the current work is that the story of my personal involvement and various levels of media and political engagements and power plays in our political landscape is eloquently told with nothing held back. Without preempting the book reviewer, I can state clearly that this book is a rich package that explores many key issues which have continued to agitate our fragile federation, including the role of the media in deepening democratic values and championing the cause of good governance in the land. In addition to interesting specialized packages that include the civil war experience in the former enclave of Biafra, the book undertakes an in-depth analysis of the political and economic conditions of Nigeria and concludes that the failure of governance in the nation has as much to do with the failure of leadership as with structural imbalance in the polity. It is my firm conviction that readers will find this book very useful and rewarding, given the powerful experiences I want to draw from it. On behalf of the planning committee for this book presentation, I wish to welcome again very warmly to this ovation. My special gratitude goes to the members of the high table and other eminent personalities in this hall for obliging us with their distinguished presence and time. I want to single out our dear sister and philanthropist, Ms. Nelly Onyechoke, who is the founder and chief executive of Nelly Onyechoke Foundation for Community and Human Development, who had to travel all the way from Maryland in the United States of America, just to be part of this event. I cannot thank you enough for your kind nature. You are welcome to your fatherland. Finally, I welcome all of you, our guests, distinguished in other nations, for finding time to be with us. I wish all of us a fruitful heart. Thank you and God bless. I welcome you all to the launch of the book, Media, Politics, and Power, authored by my friend of several decades, Emeka Musu, PhD. In today's Nigeria, where hustling has become an occupation, and being a delegate to political party primaries, I show the best return on investment, the discipline and tedium of writing a book, as a maker has done, needs our commendation. On our behalf, I congratulate him for this achievement and pray and hope that this will not be his last book. I had the privilege of writing the foreword to the book. In my view, the title of the book is not only diversionary, it is misleading, as the book is not only about the media, politics, and power in Nigeria. This is what I said about the book in my foreword, and I quote, the book is rather the author's story 
about his life from childhood to adulthood. The major social political events and experiences of the time, including the defining Nigerian civil war, which formed the prism from which he sees and interprets politics, power, and the media, and shaped his perspective. He tells of his personal story, his personal struggles and involvement in those events. This is the story of struggles from childhood to an eminent sojourn in journalism and his arrival in the public service. It is the story of any Nigerian who grew up in the village in his time, particularly those of the Igbo nationality, and a testimony to determination and resilience, end of quote. This is my impression of the book. I am not the reviewer of the book, neither am I the guest speaker on this occasion. I will not encroach on the territories of these two most notable personalities who have been given these assignments. I, however, will exercise my power and privilege as chairman of this occasion to use this opportunity to make the following very brief comments on some issues in the book. The first is the Nigerian Civil War. The war, brutal as it was, was an opportunity for a common national experience that Nigeria missed. The lessons of the war have been largely lost by those who were not in its immediate theater. The war has not been properly documented so that succeeding generations can learn its lessons. To promote collective self-denial and amnesia, we even stop teaching history in our schools so that the story of the Civil War will not be told. Great nations have at some point or the other in their history had the experience in which our citizens at the same time of the event, shared it. The Civil War was the nearest we got to such an experience, but we meet its historical impact and input. Our dysfunctional so-called federal youth, youth unitary state and its inherent contradictions that have stifled our development Restructuring is now inevitable. Our constitutional structure today has stalled development, as is evident from all indices. The collapse of our social institutions and our security, large-scale poverty, in fact, it is no longer large-scale poverty, it is industrial-scale poverty, the loss of values, etc we can only regress and will continue to do so until we restructure for greater functionality and efficiency. The competition for the monopoly of violence between the state and non-state actors, along with corruption, are all evidence of an inefficient structure. Every situation, they say, reinforces itself and our situation will only get worse until we do something drastic and dramatic. The missed turn of June 12, 1993 elections that would have eliminated tribalism and religion from our national discourse. These two are issues we must discard if we must build a nation and make progress. Our democratic space is shrinking by the day through what I refer to as delegated democracy. Our democratic rights 
have been surrendered in every sphere to chief executives who now exercise them on our behalf. If you go to the states, each member of a political party will tell you he's waiting for the governor to speak, to give directives, to give directions for them to follow. We have just finished the political primaries of the ruling party, the party to which I belong. Fortunately, we got to a point where we didn't we have to wait anymore for one person to speak. But for a long time, we were waiting for Mr. President to speak, even through body language. Those of my generation were taught in English and sometimes in Latin. But we never studied body language. So when it comes to body language, we are still stuck illiterates. Then you now take the political space proper. Gradually, the Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the Federal Executive Council are becoming retirement homes for governors and governors only. So our political space is just being limited and being narrowed to with due respect to people like Dr. Bonayono, former governor, former chairman of political party, former minister. It is only governors who can occupy space today. The dollarization of our choice making process. Even my friend Nick Williams, <laughs> for a moment, thought he was a delegate. Yes, <laughs> because being a delegate today, it is the only assurance of peace. In fact, somebody told me at the tennis court yesterday that the only guarantee of peace in this tennis court is $10,000. So our political processes are being dollarized. It has its implications. I have no views on these issues I've raised. They are issues I just distilled from the book. But like I say, Ishegu Nadeni is the master. In fact, I used to think he was a journalist, but I think he's making a new career as a book reviewer. Ishegu, I wish you well in this new and never, I will be ready to also review my own book that is coming out soon. <laughs> to put it mildly, we are in dire straits. To get out of this, we must be resourceful enough to forge an elite consensus of Nigeria and the Nigerian of our dreams. I apologize for this digression. My simple task is to welcome you to this event and to recommend the book, Media, Politics, and Power, by Emeka Mosu, PhD, to you all. Thank you very much. Symphony on YouTube. Please be sure to subscribe and like our videos for updates.